Warm greetings everyone. On behalf of W4W Foundation, a think tank instituted as a citizens collective, we welcome you to another session of Wednesdays for Water. The conversation today is on water and biodiversity series 8 on exploring water snakes. Wednesdays for Water is a water conversation series towards understanding better the nuances of water conservation and management. The objective is to engage with water experts, grassroots practitioners, policymakers, and youth to learn their thoughts and ideas about the complex intervent issues associated with water and the possible solutions. We have expanded to have more activities like the Friday Waters and the Monday Munching with Women for Water, besides organizing water workshops, water walk and talks, seminars, special courses, and conference panels to continue the water conversation in various possible ways. Please visit our website www.w4w.in for more details. We are running a biodiversity series to bring our conversations focus on the other species and to moderate the session, we have Dr. Jayati Chaure. For today's session on water snakes, we have Dr. B. Sadashiva and Dr. Amit Manhas as speaker and K. Srinija Aparna as discussant. Uh, Dr. Jayati Chaure is the Executive Director at the South Asia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Water Resources Studies, uh, commonly known as Saki Waters. She holds a PhD degree in uh, Ecosystem-Based and uh, Integrated Water Resource Management from the Indian Institute of Forest Management, Bhopal, and Forest Research Institute, University, Dehradun. I shall now hand over to Dr. Jayati to take the session forward. And thank you so much, uh, Prashika and uh, Mansi. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? It's clear. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, uh, once again, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our today's uh, session, which is uh, eighth session or episode of the Water and Biodiversity series. Uh, uh, so today's session is titled as uh, Exploring Water Snakes. Just to uh, provide you a background of the series, <clears throat> As we all know that uh, biodiversity loss is one of loss is one of the most uh, uh, pressing concerns of our time, and um, we need to understand that every individual's engagement and commitment to protecting biodiversity are crucial to uh, mitigating this crisis. Uh, by raising awareness, uh, supporting conservation efforts, and advocating for sustainable practices, uh, we can uh, collectively work towards uh, preserving the rich uh, variety of life which we have on our uh, planet Earth. So in this context, uh, since 2000, uh, February 2023, uh, this series has been dedicated to creating public awareness about aquatic biodiversity and their conservation status through our monthly online uh, sessions held every uh, second Wednesday of the month. Uh, in our previous sessions, we uh, focused on various groups of uh, aquatic uh, creatures uh, and their uh, conservation status and the challenges they face. Um, uh, ranging from uh, indigenous freshwater uh, fish and uh, coral reef ecosystems, we had topics like uh, um, shark, rays, uh, and uh, sea turtles, mangroves. Um, uh, last uh, uh, series was uh, last episode was on plankton. Uh, so our today's uh, session uh, will take us to the mysterious uh, world of uh, water snakes and their vital role in our um, ecosystems. Uh, so, very warm welcome once again to all our distinguished guests and uh, audience. Uh, we encourage uh, all of you to actively participate and hope this session will inspire all of us uh, to contribute to the conservation efforts. Uh, so, let me now invite our first speaker, Dr. B. Sadashiva. Uh, Dr. B. Sadashivaya is an assistant professor of botany uh, at uh, Dr. B.R.R. Government uh, Engineer Government Degree College, uh, Jetcherla, which is um, at uh, Mahbub Nagar district. Uh, he has been working on the uh, rescue and uh, uh, rescue of snakes and other animals since 2010. Uh, so far, more than 6,500 snakes have been rescued by him. 
um, and released in their uh, natural ecosystems. He has conducted many awareness camps and trained uh, more than 50 students um, on uh, snakes identification and conservation and one more interesting fact is that he has uh, discovered uh, he has discovered five new plant species and also uh, played a uh, played an instrumental uh, role in establishing telangana biodiversity uh, garden so uh, very warm welcome to uh, dr sadashivaya and over to you sir thank, thank you, you am i audible yes uh, shall I share my uh, screen? Uh, yes, please. And there are some surprises also uh, in today's session, <laughs> which I'll not disclose now. <laughs> so please stay tuned. Is it visible? Uh, yes, sir, it's visible. <clears throat> yeah, good evening to one and all who are there in our. Uh, uh, discussion, especially on conservation of biodiversity, especially aquatic biodiversity. Today we are going to discuss about uh, uh, a little bit information regarding aquatic reptiles. So uh, let us come. It is a very informat. Uh, it is very uh, short and sweet uh, uh, presentation. This is our own organization. Uh, we established this organization for conservation of snakes in 2015. Um, according to uh, Bhagavad Gita, the sixth chapter, 29th sloka, the person that means the yogi, here the yogi means the knowledge fellow, uh, the harmonious fellow with the nature, who treat all the living organisms on the earth like Lord. That means all the living organisms on the earth are equal, one and, one and equal. And the same thing uh, noted by the Nobel Quran, there are around 600 surahs that deals with animals. And there are six chapters named after animals in Quran. Uh, one, one chapter, that is sixth chapter, with the 143 uh, surahs is a serpent. The name of the uh, chapter also is a serpent. And the, like that, the Holy Bible also uh, told that, it is explained that, Especially in the uh, Old Testament, Adhikandamu, first chapter 24th stanza, all the living organisms on the earth are equal. If you take any religious uh, or spiritual thing, uh, all they are uh, telling that all the living organisms on the earth are equal, including human being. We are not super or we are not heroes. Coming to the today's topic that is importance of reptiles, they are part and parcel of complex food web. And if they last, we are going to last the uh, biodiversity. And there, there may be a ecological imbalance due to the loss of uh, reptiles. And these reptiles, they can eat a number of our enormous insects, uh, earthworms, ants, termites, etc., etc. And also they are food for so many animals like frogs, monitor lizards, snakes, mongoose, and other especially several bird species. And uh, a little introduction regarding uh, reptilia or reptiles. What, what are the reptiles? Reptiles are nothing but the animals which are laying eggs. And the, the, the they have the nature that is uh, ectothermic nature. That, that means they are cold-blooded animals and they produce amniotic eggs. And these reptiles were originated in around 312 million years, million years ago, around that means Carboniferous period. There are four major orders in Reptilia, which includes, uh, which consists or which possess around 12,000 species of reptiles. Among these, the first one is the order Testudines, and then Crocodilia, Squamata, and Rhynchocephalia. Coming to one by one, there are some other groups that are already extinct. Uh, many years back, and these are the extinct reptiles from our, from our uh, nature or from our earth. And there are two major lineages in reptiles discovered by the scientists. One is anapsids and the other one is diapsids. Anapsids, which includes turtles and tortoises, diapsids, crocodiles, turtles, and lizards and snakes. And these, generally, I just now I told you, they produced 
uh, amniotic eggs. And the entire skin of the reptiles, in general, they are made up of keratin. And they are the major controller of, uh, control of other animals like insects, or the population of rodents, or the population of frogs, and other fishes. And coming to the first order in the reptilia, that is testudines. It includes uh, turtles and tortoises. There are around 360 species are there on the earth. Out of 360, 60% are threatened. This is very, very important. That means they are on the verge of extinction also. Among these 360, only 29 are freshwater. Mostly they are, uh, they are living in marine waters. Among these 29, 24 are turtles and 5 are tortoises. And uh, there, there is a uh, statistic uh, regarding the, uh, especially the threats to the turtles. Uh, in one decade, that is 1990 to 2000, around 8 million turtles were killed by the human being for uh, poaching or for hunting or for food or any, any other uh, is requirements. And also the major threats for these are habitat destruction, especially light pollution on the water, and also fishing and hunting using the other uh, nets also. And this is one uh, wonderful story regarding our uh, the ecological or mythological importance of turtles in our Hindu mythology. We know we are well well known about uh, Shira Sagara Madana. So. At the same time, we one side we are worshipping the uh, turtles or the tortoise in the name of God. Uh, that is one of the avatars of Lord Vishnu. That is Kurma Avatara. At the same time, we are polluting the habitat of the turtles. And you can see the right side photograph how we are affect how we are affecting the uh, the health health condition of the turtles. This is very pathetic condition. And these are the, some of the types of turtles and other uh, freshwater turtles from our own India. And then uh, uh, freshwater turtles from North America. And let us come to the another uh, second order that is crocodilia. Uh, they are nothing but crocodiles. Based on the, the length of the snout, they are divided in other types. And they appeared in nine, 94 million years ago, around Crustaceous period. The entire body is covered with scales, but they are non-overlapping. The scales are non-overlapping. Almost all the crocodiles are predators, and they are huge animals. And, and these are the, some of the types of crocodiles and alligators and girls in our uh, India and also other parts of the world. And in the same uh, same time, we are worshipping the crocodiles as a, a vehicle for the Lord Varuna, but we are killing the crocodile for the skin and also for meat. That is another pathetic condition. And then the third order, the largest order of reptiles, that is Quamata, which recorded with around 11,500 species of uh, uh, snakes and also geckos and all other uh, reptiles, which includes in Quamata. And then these, the members of squamata, they have the skin with overlapping scales and also the shields and the heads. And these skins, they periodically molting. They have, they have the capacity to remove their skin, the dead skin. And if you see the length of the body of squamata members, it is a little, uh, that means 16 mm, 1.6 centimeters to around 21 feet length. The, the dwarf gecko that was recorded by the or discovered by the scientists, the smallest squamata member is 16 mm uh, in the total length of the body from snout to wind. And then if you take the reticulated python, it is around 21 feet length. This is the first one, uh, the dwarf gecko, just 16 mm length. And then this is the second one around uh, 21 feet length. Uh, reticulated python. Then if you take some of the parts, especially the squamata is divided into some of the parts based on the uh, characters, based on the body characters. 
Now we are going to discuss about the snakes, especially marine snake or freshwater snake or water snakes. Uh, again, uh, we are coming coming back to our uh, Hindu mythology. Just now we discussed about the uh, Chira Sagar Madana. This uh, this picture from the the airport of Thailand, I think. So then they are uh, they are clear that the theory they are giving the reptiles are involved in our mythology. And also the same picture here also, how the how the snakes were involved in our Indian mythology. Why I am telling all these mythological examples? That means they are part and parcel of our culture. That is the important character here. And then uh, let us go some of the common water snakes in our area. This, this is anhydrous anhydrous, uh, smooth scale water snake is very common. Now, due to pollution or due to and due to the over uh, exploitation of the area, especially the uh, ponds and tanks by the local people in the name of real estate or ventures, we are going to uh, we are going to we are going to decrease the number of the uh, smooth scaled water snakes. And this is another very important, very common species of water snake that is Xenocrotus piscator. We observed for the past 13 years the color with n number of colors. The color variation is very, very common in this snake. And also, one more interesting thing, when we are going to rescue the snake, when we when we catch the uh, tail, it is automatically uh, cut down from the main body. That means the autotomy is also present in the snakes. The autotomy nature is very common in the lizards. It's it lays around more than 70 eggs in a clutch. And in general, nowadays, they are they are they prefer to drain a system in the cities or in the municipalities. Why? Because we are lack of, we are lacking the freshwater ecosystems near our uh, cities or municipalities. The mating season for this is November to December. And this, uh, this is one example. Uh, it is around uh, three years back, we rescued one uh, checkered keel back. Uh, the night itself, it lays around 120 eggs. All were hatched and out of 120 eggs, uh, 116 were succeeded. Then this is another a rare snake from Telangana area and other regional areas. Uh, this is a green uh, alu uh, keelback snake. Again, a rare species found in the forests of Eastern Ghats. Then uh, let us come to the sea snakes. Uh, the snakes, sea snakes are uh, venomous, but they are uh, lazy in their nature. That means they, they are docile, but they are deadly venomous. Now, due to the fishing, most of the snakes they are entered into the uh, fishing net and they are killed by the uh, fishermen. That is the major loss for the sea snakes. And the last order of reptilia, that is Zipocephalia, they look like a lizards, they are reptiles only. There is a one uh, famous example for uh, Zipocephalia, that is uh, Totara. This is, a, it is an endemic species to New Zealand, uh, Spinodon punctatus. It, it was evolved around two, 238 to 240 million years ago. That means early Jurassic period. Here, the spinodontia means spinodontia means the teeth shape. That the, the teeth shape is wedge-like. So mainly they are carnivorous, and some of the species of Rhynchocephalia they are uh, omnivorous, and they are some of them very few are, are uh, herbivorous. And this is one example for spinodontia, spinodont punctatus. And then conservation. We are talking about conservation. What is the definition for conservation? Conservation is nothing but protection and upkeepment and scientific management of biodiversity so as to maintain it and its threshold level and derive sustainable benefits for the present generation as well as the future, future generations. And uh, this is one uh, interesting slide here. We cannot recreate, we cannot give rebirth to any species which which already gone from our uh, earth. 
we cannot produce a dinosaur by by putting some crores and crores of rupees in biotechnological lab or any other lab so that means we have to protect our own biodiversity rather than uh, trying to reproduce them and this is another interesting thing when human civilization is not good at that time the forest is wonderful when human is civilized like us there is no forest at all so the major threats for entire reptiles is habitat loss and another one is skin industries the major threat to reptiles is skin industries and road kills and also especially for the snakes road kills and merciless killing is another uh, interesting fact for threatening threatening to the species there is a one word that is attitude is a very it is a little word but that makes a big difference in human being so what is our attitude or your attitude towards the biodiversity we are doing conservation activities like this we are not doing conservation original conservation just we are acting as a conservationist this is my bother about the conservation of species of plants or animals etc and in one way we are worshiping the snakes but in the same way we are killing the snakes for their for their skin or for their flesh then coming to the even though we are worshiping the snakes at the same time if you find a snake in our home what we are going to do definitely if you ask 100% and uh, 95 members they will give answer uh, we are going to kill why are they really do harm to us no and never never so this is our practice for the past 13 years from 2010 we are doing this work and we are giving some training to the students and the enthusiastic and nature lovers like this and we are we are creating awareness yesterday also i attended a degree college to create awareness among the students about the snakes so far i completed around 825 awareness programs on snakes for the students especially student community in rural areas of telangana and andhra pradesh and the last uh, slide of my presentation is don't be as a ego person be like a eco person if we are uh, along with the uh, all other animals and uh, all other creature and uh, then it is eco friendly and we are not top of the uh, food web or uh, food chain thank you very much for giving this great opportunity um thank you so much uh, dr sadashivaya so our um, surprise thing will be now or uh, afterwards like during the ses- uh, q and a session <laughs> okay so uh, thank you so much uh, dr sadashivaya uh, for thank such you. an interesting session and we look forward to um, having uh, a very meaningful um, uh, open discussion with you later okay uh, now i would like to invite our uh, next uh, ex- uh, expert speaker uh, dr uh, amit manhas uh, he is an assistant professor at government college uh, suthalia rajgarh in madhya pradesh he has done his phd on understanding the role of uh, climate change on reptiles under different uh, temperature and uh, tropical condition so uh, welcome to you uh, dr amit uh, thank you jayati ma'am uh, okay i would like to congratulate uh, uang your organization for doing such a wonderful job because uh, today awareness is the main thing that we need to do uh, to aware the lay people lay people uh, lay man is the man that can uh, do main protection in the land so it's uh, best thing you are doing uh shall i share so for the session what i have chosen is aquatic biodiversity their threats their conservation uh with special reference to uh, aquatic snakes 
So I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit of aquatic biodiversity, what aquatic biodiversity, their importance, what threat, threats they are posing, uh, they are having, and the conservation policies or conservation points, what, what we need to do uh, for their uh, better uh, balancing and uh, conservation purposes with this uh, special uh, reference of aquatic snakes that we have, that we uh, commonly encounter in our daily life uh, that I have chosen. So our view, our view of my, uh, this presentation is these two parts, uh, biodiversity data as I, uh, I have conveyed. We are going to uh, know about the introduction of the basic introduction about the biodiversity, the part of biodiversity actually the aquatic uh, uh, other than terrestrial, then we are going to uh, take some part of uh, snakes, their general introduction, importance, uh, their threats, and the conservation uh, the, to control those threats. If we control those threats that are posing danger to these animals, we can control uh, the whole disaster things uh, regarding the animal uh, like snakes or any other creature that live on this planet. And a little bit of classification, the basis of classification normal for the lay people, how can we differentiate uh, animals uh, from one another and some of the common semi-aquatic and aquatic animals with the conclusion. So India is the mega, one of the mega diverse biodiverse country around uh, the 12 other mega diversity countries, uh, contributing 8.1% 8 8 of species diversity, that too from the land area. We are not talking about the marine aquatic uh, systems, but uh, on the land mass that we have only 2.4% of land area uh, to the world that contributes about 81% of the biodiversity to the world, making it one of the uh, 12 mega biodiversity countries in the world. Now, India diversity demonstrated by the fact that more than 45,000 plus 500 plant species are there in our country that have been documented so far, uh, with including animal species that are 91 plus 2,000 species, 200 animal species from different biogeographical zones of our country. So to consider to be a biodiverse country, one region should be at least 5,000 plus species of plants and animals together contribute to become a mega diversity countries. But to think about the look of the data that we have in our country, more species are discovering uh, nowadays day by day, need to uh, study more and research more for more uh, type of uh, plants and animals that we can discover from our land. Now, in terms of endemic vertebrate groups, in these animals that we have around 45 or 9,000, in these animals, we have around some of the species that are endemic to our land only, that nowhere these animals can be found. These are endemic vertebrate animals. In this category, India ranks uh, on 10th uh, state of uh, with 69 species of birds, uh, fifth on the reptilian stage, and one, sorry, seventh on the uh, amphibians. I mean, the reptilian fauna, and, uh, reptilian fauna, and the amphibian fauna that uh, live the both life of amphibians and uh, that live on land as well as on uh, water ecosystems. These two fauna contribute the most of the endemic species uh, in our country as compared to the world. Now, see, today we know about much more about the deep uh, space as we are landing on moons. We have technology to land on moons, but we don't have the technology to land on uh, marine ecosystems and the oceanic ecosystem that we can find more of the diversity uh, because around 75% of our land, our planet uh, is uh, uh, in water. So we know as of it that the greatest marine diversity we can found in the oceanic system or the aquatic ecosystems but we know fairly little about this biodiversity because nobody talks about the marine ecosystem. Whenever there is a word comes in mind that biodiversity, everybody talks about the ecosystem that on land, land biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity. Nobody thinks about the biodiversity that we can discover in marine or freshwater ecosystems as the greatest marine diversity occurs in the coral reefs, eustrations, the deep ocean floor that we have in our, uh, land. 
Besides, biodiversity is higher near the coast, coastal areas and the surface because of habitat and the food source variety we have in our land. The world marine and the freshwater system provide an important ecological and economical service since ancient times, as Dr. Sada said, we have worshipping these animals since, uh, since ancient times and we need to preserve right now. The thing is, uh, we human, humans have a problem of uh, doing things when it's on this extinct of extinction. We never think early, we think late when there is uh, uh, disasters uh, nature happens. Now, what is aqu aquatic biodiversity? The biodiversity that we have in uh, aquatic ecosystem, whether it's marine or freshwater ecosystem, whether it's in lakes, whether it's in ponds, whether it's in streams, that all variety of life on that we have in aquatic system is considered to be aquatic biodiversity. It includes diversity within species, between species, and as well as within their ecosystem. They, they are both interconnected with each other, whether it's uh, one species with another and with their surrounding environments. All, all and everything is interconnected, and we need to think about all of them at once. Now, importance of biodiversity. What are the importance are there? We have uh, biodiversity is every species, as I said, is interrelated and interdependent on each other. As of aquatic habitats have a significant economical role and aesthetic value as well as maintaining the general environmental health. Human health traditionally relied on aquatic source. We, we humans have uh, relied on this, these aquatic source since ancient time for food, medicine, for trade, and find range of natural uh, products for the recreational, commercial purpose, including transportation, trading, fishing, tourism, everything could lay on these aquatic sources, but we are not controlling them. We are deteriorating these aquatic resources to the extent. Besides, what organisms rely on these diverse range of water sources? If we destroy them, these organisms that uh, survive in these water surfaces, uh, water, uh, water habitat, uh, their habitat, their life, uh, maybe in uh, tragedy, as we are destroying their food and feeding ground as well. As biodiversity declines, these links will uh, weaken and break, uh, causing harm to all species in the environment. As these all species are interlinked in a chain and a life cyclic chain, that one thing is dependent on other, another thing is dependent on other. If we break one chain, one out of it, all the cycle gets uh, harm out of it. So we need to think right now and do the right full source to do how we can survive. How can we protect those animals that are valuable to us? Think it as a heritage for us and for generations that uh, for the generation when they come and see these animals live or they want to see it in museums at uh, this type of snake or uh, this type of fauna that we have in our old times. Now threat, the major threats to these or uh, any other animals is us, we humans are deteriorating everything that are indirect uh, effects that are uh, posing threat to these animals are us humans, our increasing population, our demanding nature, our greediness is one of the main kind factor that is deteriorating and uh, making a posing a threat to these animals. Over the last century, uh, us peoples have come to dominate this planet as a whole, causing rapid ecosystem, rapid urbanization in terms of uh, development, changing massive uh, forest uh, forest systems, making it loss of whole biodiversity across the planet. Through though changes and extensions have been naturally occurring uh, in our planet since ancient times, but they are at slow rate. But what we have done, we have changed it in unprecedented. We have increased this declining change to uh, level high, level up from the natural source, the natural cause of their extinction. As according to ICN Red List version of 2010, 94 species of animals, mammals, sorry, mammals, 78 species of birds, around 66 species of amphibians, 30 species of reptiles. 122 species of fishes, 113 species of invertebrates, the, uh, the backboneless animals, and 2255 species of plants are critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable 
they are all categorized these categories in these categories. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Amit, uh, actually, uh, we are running short of time. So uh, thank you so much for providing this information. But can we uh, like first focus on snakes because uh, it's already 6, uh, 5.40? Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your understanding. So snakes. So what are snakes? These are the type of roots, the amniotic snakes covered in a skin of supple living scales, legless, with starry eyes that never blink or close because they lack. Uh, these eyelids, they have flickering folk time for smell and taste and sometimes fangs that deliver toxic venom to uh, uh, the, their prey. Snakes, see, snakes inspire fascination and feelings in a way that no other type of animal can. This is a thing that can creep people So this is what snakes can do. So these are legless, large predators to the habitat of environment for food chain. They play a pivotal role in these food webs in an in ecosystem, in any ecosystem, whether it's aquatic, terrestrial, or arboreal, fossorial, whatever the uh, habitat, they are doing their best in their food webs. Snakes employ their highly developed sense of sight. They have modified to this level that they have highly developed sense of sight, taste, hearing, and a touch to locate, to recognize, and take their prey, making them a best and hunters and ambush predators, while some use lethal dosage of venom. Venom is a modified saliva to paralyze their prey, while others crush their prey to death with the powerful muscular body, while they lack venom. The other one picture, you can sleep python was, this is Ajgar, Karl Ajgar, who is uh, constricting their prey deer. And these are the fangs of cobra uh, with whom they inject uh, venom into their prey. What venom can do is venom dissolve, starts dissolving the prey, their prey before they can digest it. So it uh, helps them in digesting actually. So these snakes actually they are uh, a very peculiar type of snakes. They have peculiar type of nature. Their secrets not uh, uh, hidden life. They, are, they live a secret hidden life that people know very little about them. Uh, and another reason could be their peculiarity as they are cryptic in nature. They can be found. They cannot be found by uh, yourself uh, uh, if you look for them. They come at their own certain times, whether it's foraging or feeding or mating, only then they are uh, available. They can be seen out and they out of their habitat and uh, open. So snakes are incredible active creatures capable of moving across anything, across uh, anything like sand, rocks, uh, burrowing in soil, uh, squeezing through cracks and crevices and rocks. Even in climbing vertical walls, they are uh, have the capability to uh, climb to a tree. As you can say in Dantrophis, this is the bronze back tree snake, which can climb to trees as well. So there are species of snake. There are a variety of species of snake, ranging from this small one that looks like a heart You can see on my right, there is Indotiphilus brahmans, also called as uh, blind snake. This looks like a uh, earthworm, around uh, 10 to 15 centimeters of length. And on the other side, you can look for python molars, which is uh, can grow up to the uh, height length of uh, almost 15 to 16 feet, and a width of uh, almost a adult man leg. All of these are uh, semi-aquatic species. So they occur in a variety of uh, color also. We can see in different colors and patterns uh, of them, most of which are mimic the environment for this kind of the adaptive nature for survival with a few of them are brightly banded like crates, like the specimen you are seeing on the right is totally harmless. This is called banded kukuri. And flag are having a spectral sheen in sunlight. Uh, the, uh, they can be found in a wide variety of Indian habitats from the rainforest to the outbacks, from the fresh water to the streams, to the oceans, even in your backyard. The second image of this uh, is the rattlesnake, which is very common. We, all these specimens I'm showing are commonest species in our country that uh, a man can encounter any time in their day life. So it's better to know them uh, uh, very well. The more you study about snake, this is the main factor. We cannot identify snake or classify snake by just looking uh, or classifying them in scientific manners. There are many things we need to understand about 
uh, their identification. So the best way for a layman is uh, the more you study about the snakes that uh, your neighbor could have, the more you realize the amazing creatures worth up for respect and protection as well as animals whom we can learn. The most of the specimens that we found around uh, us can, in our environment, sound environment, only by them can identify those, whether it's venomous or non-venomous, whether it's harmless or not. Now, fear and fascination. Snakes are among the least popular animal in the planet. In spite of this, they have beautiful creatures of this land. Snakes like spider leeches and other creep crawlers are frequently seen as animals of fear and despise of spiders and snakes as well uh, uh, contain this venom uh, with a few ability to kill, with a few have ability to kill. Only some specimens are, uh, some specimen of snake, species of snakes that can able to kill uh, a human. Uh, but uh, other than that, they all are harmless specimens which need our protection. This has led to the assumption that the only good snake is a dead snake in people's mind. The great majority of spiders face the same stigma of the feet. What we have right now is the assumption, the perception about the snakes that the snake is dangerous. Snakes are not dangerous, but it's our perception from since the times our elders have decided to give this perception to us. This is snake, this is dangerous to you. Uh, to you. This perception needs to be broken down. Only then these specimens can be protected. Now snakes normally prefer to flee. When we oppose them, they, they prefer to flee, although they can turn protective if counted, the majority of snakes bites occurs when people attempt to kill them. Only when people attempt to kill some snake or try to uh, kill them, mm, only then the snake bite cases are uh, around in the neighbors. Snakes pose little or to no harm to, uh, to humans when left alone. They do nothing but flee and do their own job. Now, importance of snake, why snakes are important as what role they are doing. We frequently forget snakes and other reptiles that they are critical parts of our predator, a food web ecosystem, uh, uh, natural ecosystem, whether it's aquatic, terrestrial, or arboreal. However, snakes are the prey of predators, as we know, including other snakes in a variety of ecosystems. They can only be a threat when they are invasive species to an ecosystem with little or no means of controlling their pollution. This happens when snake introduction and removal may result in anticipated con consequences of an ecosystem. If we move one snake from uh, uh, one ecosystem to put it on another ecosystem, that is what uh, uh, make it uh, invasive species in that uh, particular ecosystem. And uh, there makes a competition between the two species, which is not good for them. So without them, the number of prey species who, would drastically increase, making it difficult for predators that eat snakes for food. And the prey of their species may increase in number. Uh, as an example, suppose uh, rats, there's rat snakes eat rat. If we uh, let rat snakes out of our ecosystem and rats grow in uh, numbers, as we know, one rat can breed around one 815 species, 15 individual in a year. And suppose multiply it with two years, three years, how much rats we can get. So it can be difficult for an ecosystem to survive without these animals and we need to protect them. This is the one thing that is necessary for this one. The threats what are posing uh, to these snooks are, uh, the major threat is the population, whether of serpents or other living creatures, habit loss, degradation of their habitat as the main source of their uh, loss, including urban, suburban development, aquatic habit, Habitat alteration from water withdrawals and stream diversions, water pollution, off road vehicles using terrestrial inhabitant. Development is having negative impact on their habitat uh, by destroying and detracting their feeding and breeding grounds. Our life on earth, including humans, depends on maintaining high level biodiversity, and snakes are the crucial part of, uh, of them. So these are the classification that are given in these venomous and on the basis of their nature, snakes are classified as venomous and non-venomous. And on the basis of uh, habitat, what habitat they are using, they are classified as aquatic, semi-aquatic, uh, whether it's fresh water, uh, marine water, and terrestrial uh, are those that uh, live on land. So there are around 4,000 38 species of snakes that dominate uh, this planet. Uh, out of them, 300 snake species are uh, from our countries. Our country can contribute 300, uh, 300 snake species. Out of which 60 species are venomous, 40 plus are mildly venomous that are not harmful to us. 
and 180, a large number of species that are non and totally harmless. And these uh, specimens are classified into major four categories, uh, families, Colibridia, Elipidia, Idophilidia, and Vipidia. This is contrary in most of the diverse group of families in snakes. The majority of them are non-venomous, uh, consisting of rare fang snakes, which are not harmful. These are some of the images of like common wolf snake on the left and rat snake on the right. Lipidia mostly uh, includes the cobras and the creates the most dangerous and uh, venomous snakes uh, in our country. Uh, uh, from the left, this is common trait. On the middle, this is Nata, the Indian cobra. And the uh, left, uh, sorry, right of Fekasana, the king cobra. Both of these species are highly venomous and can kill a human if by taken. This is great. Uh, most of the cases of snake bite happen uh, by this species, which is a nocturnal species, come uh, which is active at night. This India cobra, we have different uh, variation in cobras. We have spectacle cobra on the right and monospectacle cobra on the left. Now, these are uh, sea snakes come under uh, the snake family Hylophidia. Uh, on the left, you can see a spine pallid sea snake from Maharashtra. Uh, and this one is yellow lipped viper, the banded, crates, the banded sea crate. This is also hook nose sea snake that is found on the coastal regions of uh, our oceanic ecosystems. But this is the last uh, Vipridia family of the venomous snakes uh, that we have in our country. Uh, the first one is Echinus carnatus, uh, that is soft scale viper, and the second one is Davaya uh, rasilia, which is Russell viper. Both are uh, both have neurotoxic venom. This is a close up of these snakes. The fangs, the uh, longest fangs we have in India uh, of these uh, Russell vipers that deliver uh, venom through them. This is Python, of, uh, what we know him as a common algicar that we can find uh, in both habitats, uh, whether it's terrestrial or uh, aquatic, swamps, marshes, rock footwills, open forest, everywhere we can find it. All these species are cosmopolitan. This is some non venomous Moida family snake that we encounter in daily life. The first one, upper one, is a common sand boa. The second one is red sand boa, also known as do muasa. I would like to conclude it. Being ectothermic, that means snakes do not maintain their own body temperature. They need some external source to maintain their own body heat. Uh, like uh, we do, we maintain our uh, heat uh, by metabolism, but they do not able to do that. So snakes lay on environmental factors, environmental sources for heat gain as an option of activities. And they're more limited uh, than the endothermic tetrapods like we do. Uh, so most of the snakes regulate their body temperature by taking advantage of sun, warm surfaces and their environmental for heat gain. Besides through conduction and convection that also gain heat, while for the heat loss they retreat to shady places and cool surface. Under normal circumstances, climatic conditions such as temperate, uh, temperate and tropical condition, temperature seems to be the main uh, key factor for their survival and abundance of snake prone and, and in in every ecosystem. Beside this, other factors that are anthropogenic, that are the we human created these factors is unsustainable development resulting in massive deforestation, encroachment of land and water passing, unwanted unjustified modification of breeding site for the sake of tourism and uh, uh, trade, accidental deaths of snakes due to vehicular traffic in urban areas, mass killing of uh, these snakes on account of uh, man made man and uh, snake conflict, exploitation by way of export for trading. These are all the uh, parameters that regulate the distribution and survival of the snake fauna around the globe. This is what uh, deforestation effects are. This is happens when encroachment or breeding sites are being uh, modified. Uh, this is the reason for the loss of uh, biodiversity uh, of these snake fauna or aquatic biodiversity. This is the unjustifiable modification of breeding sites, which is not required at these places, but they are doing this and destroying the uh, breeding sites of uh, these animals. So this is it. Thank you for listening.
thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Amit, for this uh, very I'm informative. Time, actually, I took uh, extra time, I think. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, we know that you all are very uh, passionate about uh, your research and we would actually love to hear more from you but then we have this time constraint uh, which uh, Mansi will explain because she wants it to be uh, like yeah. more, not more than 75 minutes um, actually these are the things that they, they cannot be keep in a little I, I understand yeah, yeah. So, right. yeah, yeah actually we are planning now round two of all these sessions <laughs> because okay. they are so interesting and uh, uh, we always fall uh, like short of that uh, time. So now, um, uh, without wasting much time, I would like to invite uh, our youth discussant, uh, uh, Srinija Aparna. Srinija has done her master's in environmental sciences, and she has her own consultancy called uh, uh, Enviro, uh, Enviro Kamkar. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, to you, Srinija. Uh, now it's like over to you. Uh, so uh, you can ask your, your questions and you can also uh, pick up some questions from the chat bo box and also invite uh, like anyone who is willing to ask their own questions from uh, audience. So they can switch on their audio video and then they can ask the question. Thank you so much, Patty. Uh, and thank you each and everyone for giving me this opportunity to interact. I hope I... <coughs> So firstly, it's amazing work by Dr. Amitji and Dr. Sadashivaji. I'll quickly move to the questions. So my question first is for Sadashiva Garu. So my question is, so far you have rescued more than 6,500 snakes and you have released them into their natural ecosystems. So my question here is, how do you uh, identify these natural ecosystems? Because sometimes, uh, for example, if you rescued any terrestrial snake and you have to leave them into uh, any uh, nearby forest area, uh, such as Kambalakunda or something, sometimes these natural ecosystems can also be a threatening place for these snakes. It can be due to uh, lack of adequate amount of food or more, more predators or more population of that particular snake species itself. So how, how do you select these natural ecosystems? Is there any valid case study for this? If so, it can be very helpful for us. So actually, natural ecosystem means here, the major areas are forest only. Why we are selecting forest are, and in the forest also, we are leaving them in the water. Even though they are non-aquatic uh, snakes, we are leaving them into the water. Why? Because when we, when we leave them near water or in the water, they will go and swim for some time and they clean their entire body and they, they will go away from their natural habitats where they, they, they may hide in some rocks or they may hide in some uh, uh, detritus material like that. And let us think about, we are going to uh, release all of them into the uh, Amrava Tiger Reserve. So Amrava Tiger Reserve is a, one of the best place for the so many snakes, even though the predators are there, but at the same time, uh, they have the capacity to hide and also they have the camouflage nature in sometimes. Uh, even though they, they, they change their color within minutes or some, some time. And that is one reason we selected that area. But you asked one more thing, did you... Uh, study any case studies. No, we did not uh, study, we did not have any case study regarding that. And uh, sometimes we rescue very juvenile snakes, uh, one day babies or three days babies like that. And then we will release them in nearby area we, uh, in uh, 10 kilometers we have a uh, forest area and we will go and release them. Why? Because uh, every uh, 10 days or 15 days, we are going to release them. Why? Because uh, every day is going to Amrabha Tiger is a, is a uh, painful for me uh, because my time is uh, difficult to spare and also even the amount also because uh, um, it is 100 kilometers away from my area. That's what we are doing. 
and we are also uh, we have also have some little uh, conflict regarding this uh, area selection because uh, just now you told that if you collect in an aquatic species where we are going to release but people think that most of the if you take checkered keelback uh, that is uh, just now we discussed about uh, xenocropus species which is very common in almost all aquatic areas but in the cities or towns like vizag or any other area or in, uh, in my own say, town it is a municipality area due to the lack of the fresh water areas they are coming to the uh, drainage system through drainage system they are entering into the washrooms especially and also kitchen areas to uh, uh, to feed that is the main problem and uh, we are also uh, uh, recognized some areas especially uh, the old drainage system they lay the entire eggs in the uh, rat holes and they leave the place but totally we did not uh, survey any case studies regarding the selection of area but it is the only available areas there are two areas available to me for especially pythons and other snakes we are going to release in the amnavat tiger reserve only for the smaller snakes even though it is a venomous we are leaving them in the appanapalli reserve forest which is very near to my place around 8 to 10 kilometers away from this area that is we are doing for the past 13 years that uh, that is sad sir but yeah uh, i think uh, rather than killing rather than killing by the human beings okay. it is somewhat better to leave them into the natural areas absolutely that's that's we are doing sir uh, at times uh, to restore few uh, schedule one uh, species snakes yes uh, suppose if i have some 1 hectare or 10 hectares uh, kind of lake with me what could be ideal population size of this restoring species should be there in uh, a particular la land area or in that particular space no no here the the scheduled animal scheduled one animal means the major leaf python where we are going to rescue all the pythons we are releasing into the amravat tiger reserve especially uh, fresh water areas are more in amravat tiger reserve there are some ponds with uh, some 100 hectares mm -hmm. 100 hectares we are leaving them into that area all right uh, my second question is for uh, dr amit ji so uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, snake breeding areas so uh, as an environmental auditor uh, we are also trying to explore to promote ecotourism uh, sites in in and around vishakhapatnam and andhra pradesh so can you uh, help us in identifying these uh, uh, to identify these breeding areas see for snakes that actually they are very cryptic they are not they don't settle down to specific place there are for different species different uh, habitat requirement for uh, their breeding grounds actually from the marshy area to moisture plus areas there nami jahan zyada ho zameen mein wahan zyada breed karte hain aur maximum seasonally breed karte hain kahan zarurat hai jaane ki to jaise main study mein na yahan kiya hai sir study uh, here in bhopal tropical climate is there so uh, most of the sightings happens in for various of breeding uh, feeding everything for monsoon region when monsoon arrives the uh, sighting starts uh, for their uh, purpose everything starts from this uh, monsoon period till the end of monsoon as these snakes require a specific temperature an optimum temperature required for uh, their uh, metabolic uh, workouts uh, from 10 to around 30 uh, at least i have uh, observed this below this temperature they cannot uh, uh, work out their things as they are forging they require proper heat in their body to uh, do that work uh, for breeding as well so uh, from species to species a different uh, uh, micro habitats they require uh, for uh, breeding especially when i talk about these uh, aquatic uh, uh, surfaces where they need some uh, sandy marshy area uh, for uh, protecting their eggs laying their eggs uh, but if we provide them with uh, hard rocks so that it is difficult for them to uh, lay down their eggs there so that's it um, all right 
uh, Shunicha. So uh, there are like some questions in the chat box also you can pick up. And uh, I just would like to mention that as uh, Dr. Amit showed uh, in his PPT that uh, uh, it's a like very uh, dangerous uh, trend nowadays because we see that in the name of lake restoration or river restoration, they concretize this littoral zone, all these peripheral areas uh, in the name mm -hmm. of uh, beautification or bund strengthening. And they actually end up killing habitats of all these important uh, um, species. Uh, uh, like for example for snake or for reptiles other reptiles or amphibians or even for fish birds you need uh, those areas uh, to be available for breeding so there has to be like some proper guideline because we see especially in urban areas all uh, uh, lakes and uh, rivers they are their uh, peripheries are uh, actually concretized and use actually they are located for other uh, uh, human usage, but then they fail to understand that these are very crucial uh, uh, zones uh, in terms of uh, ecology or uh, like protecting biodiversity. So that's my concern that uh, how it can be uh, actually ad addressed uh, like at the policy level. Can be at the policy level, but see, as an individual, what I think of doing as to protect them is necessary. Lakes are uh, uh, at the places where uh, neighborhood stays. Neighborhood pressurize the policy makers to do these things uh, necessary for the protection of these angling sites or breeding sites. Then only this is possible to protect those sites and those animals there. So as an individual, every person should be concerned about this. Then only conservation is uh, justified. So, like uh, you, you want to say that public awareness is the most yes. important thing. Uh, major, is... major role public awareness. Uh, so, I think uh, can we quickly pick up one question from the chat box? And uh, Mansi, uh, do you have any question? Uh, yes, may I enter the conversation because it's uh, lake uh, talk, and I can't resist myself. Uh, <laughs> not and jumping into the conversation, but wonderful presentation and uh, talk by Sada and Amit. And uh, trust me, for last uh, nearly 25 years, I have been also screaming to my loudest of the voice not to uh, go hardscape in the littoral zone. And Jayati, you recall, in all our series also, we are talking about not to go with this hardscape of the edge of the water bodies. But uh, my questions are very simple as a lay person because I was overwhelmed uh, to look at uh, these pictures because they look beautiful as pictures. And I think one question uh, Sada has answered me, but he has answered me personally. So uh, I think everybody could not see the, our response. Uh, so I will ask a different question uh, and also request Sada to show some live friends because we saw your live friends uh, in the pre session. <laughs> so, yes, please. First, you show your live friends, and then I ask my questions. Okay. And okay. my, yeah. Will I will ask questions, questions and while now. you can show the friend, your friends. Yeah. I will show at least three species. Yes, please. Three or four friends. Yes. Oh my God, I have seen this yeah. in my childhood. Yeah. Yeah, nowadays uh, the population is uh, reducing. Uh, yes. uh, because they, of, they they fly between the branches, right? Yes. Yeah. No, no. Yes, it I have fly. seen that. It, it, it cannot fly. That is under the species. Flying okay. snake. Avid flying snake. Huh, because green. those green uh, snakes fly between the trees. I have seen uh, them. Uh, this is a green whip snake. I had to laugh. Okay. It. it is called as I had. I had to laugh. Mm -hmm. And it is very uh, common in my botanical garden. Why? Because uh -huh. in a five, five acres area, we planted around 6,000 uh, 6, individuals of plants. That gives... Uh, isn't, more... it the, isn't the snake scared of you? Are you scared of the snake? I no, think no, no, no. Aparna also wants to ask. No, no, no. It is, it, is, it is scared. It is scared. It is scared. Nice. You can see... Uh, most of the people think that it will pluck our eyes or it will enter into our nose or it will enter into our ears. So one should uh, think once, uh, our nose uh, and uh, ears, 
the limit is very uh, the depth of the pit is very less that is uh, it's a fake one and the one more thing uh, it has a smooth uh, what we called uh, um, uh, nose smooth nose it cannot pluck our eyes very smooth ah okay. uh, but why people thinking that like that it's going like this at the at the height of around 6 feet or 7 feet and the trees are especially on the bushes when we go to near the the bushes uh, it may comes around our height of the eyes and that may be the reason people thinking that it, it plucks our eyes that is wrong and okay. whenever it is going to threaten and it is in a ferocious nature it will change its color Mm -hmm. Even uh, this snake looks so comfortable, no? With it. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's yeah. what I. That's why I said, no. Show yeah, your how, friend. Come. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think it's very, very important. <laughs> I think the way uh, maybe they can also <laughs> understand, no? This uh, yes. the care yes. and the warmth. Yeah, yeah. This is very, very. Important. That's why I said, no. Show your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I will show some more. Uh, you can discuss yes, now. Please. I will yes. do some more. Yes. so my question to you is because you are restoring their lives and so i i am curious how far a snake is uh, traveling and uh, from the natural environment when we consider them as displaced you know there must be their life span and also they must be traveling up to certain distance just to give a naive question a meaning a snake will not travel from andhra to madhya pradesh to gujarat right there is a limit to which it is going to travel so just to re uh, reciprocate to what aparna was asking uh, you know so in the natural environment maybe somewhere near i don't know what is the range of their traveling and well, this is a wonderful question uh, and if they are aquatic uh, snakes can they uh, <laughs> also <laughs> travel <laughs> from madhya pradesh not madhya pradesh but no, uh, change water maharashtra to andhra to and change water you know yeah, i am curious to the change water oh. actually actually this is the wonderful question for me uh, for the past 13 years no one uh, uh, asked this question yes. because it yes. is a very really important <laughs> question people think that if you uh, if you leave them into the away from this uh, local area then how it will survive that my answer is one they are naturally from the natural habitats it may be near to us maybe 5 kilometers or 10 kilometers and uh, one more thing if if a if a person uh, is there without food if you provide some uh, white rice and dal he will be happy otherwise if you provide some biryani he will uh, enjoy <laughs> my answer is when i am going to release all these snakes into amdavad tiger reserve it is nothing but a biryani for that yeah why because it's a wonderful place it has it uh, the the area has everything water it has food it has and if you if it wants to hide there are enormous debris material on the earth especially leaf litter is more why because it is a dry deciduous area and also when when uh, the time is coming especially uh, some of the species like uh, python mostly we are rescuing python into the fishing nets especially in the month of summer summer season when the summer season comes this area is the deciduous forest all the leaves were shed down uh, from the tree then automatically the food scarcity is there the especially the outer areas of the tiger reserve not in the depth outer areas the uh, outer areas if the pythons will will come to the uh, especially the agricultural fields for uh, to feed uh, uh, for feeding and they may dependent on rodents and also sometimes for uh, some squirrels and other species like the uh, indian hare and also some uh, hen and others and in the same while while, go, while moving from one place to another place for uh, hunting the food or uh, for the purpose of food they may reach some uh, ponds tanks etc then they will uh, caught by these fishing nets 
sometimes they are they are uh, calling us some of them they will kill us they will kill them that is the main problem but if we are releasing in the natural areas even though it is away from this area even 100 kilometers or uh, more than 100 kilometers they may face some problems for some time because the, yes they may, they may face some problems no doubt at all but if we, if we are leaving them into the water then they will survive they will find they will survive yeah, but, yeah. Is, yeah, is is, yeah it, it is very much like uh, humans you know like a bengali living in andhra will initially have some problem and then adjust yes, yes. yeah and then some uh, likewise i have a very little question and then i will hand it over to shrinija because i cannot control this question i i know for turtles that when they are displaced they are highly emotional and they remain depressed for rest of their lives so uh, do snakes also have emotions and how do they manage their displacement no 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 they, they is it they studied must... is no, the emotion yes. studied uh we don't have a scientific method to study the emotions of reptiles especially okay and let us come to the snakes why i am telling this they they, they don't have emotions they may have emotions but uh, we are not um, enough to recognize that emotion yes we are now it's not no, measuring not enough and one more thing there is no parental care there is okay. no parental care in the snakes especially one or two snakes like our checkered keelback and king cobra they can uh, they can stay some time uh, checkered keelback they can stay some sometimes on the eggs especially the king cobra will build the nest oh, according to my uh, uh, knowledge they have a little uh, the quantity of brain and the qual- uh, quantity of brain is very very less maximum 1 mg like that in that in that brain it doesn't have the remembrance uh, neurons it are related to remembrance when it has the capacity to remember to remember the things to remember the place to remember their own babies then automatically emotions will come and one more thing to strengthen my answer ophiophagy is very common in this uh, snakes one snake can eat same species or it can eat another species also so when they are dependent on the other snakes it shows that very less emotions are there and in my yes. observations in my observation Oh, I think we lost connection with him. Srinija, over to you. I, I think it's all covered, madam. I have got okay, it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Samit. And over to you, Zaitu. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you so much, uh, Dr. Amit. Uh, so I think you can leave because it's really thank getting you. late for you. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. uh yeah mansi uh, you can please continue i think our uh, sada has lost connection so he's joining because we wanted to see more snakes from him yeah he has joined you have more friends with you right uh, there is an internet interruption yes i we, we see, i that. can see i can see that uh, snakes have emotions because see how yes, I, i was about to say they that they are the same as <laughs> so definitely they have emotions they have some emotions i they know definitely we, have. i according to my knowledge still now we don't have to measure the emotions of snakes because see it the, was uh, inside a closed container but still it was comfortable very calm and compose <laughs> <laughs> you we are trying to measure the emotion in the jet yeah, from a remote location <laughs> do you Adhavid have more friends scared, not they are afraid do you have more friends sada yeah i will say one more and here just now we discussed about uh, checkered keelback na ha uh, uh, this is Sir, have you ever got uh, attacked by any snake so far? 
That's a good question. Uh, oh, madam, madam, please repeat. Have you ever got attacked by any one of these snakes while you're rescuing or something? Because I always get paranoid to walk uh, on greeny areas also. I still... Uh, many, times. many times. Many times. But with the non-venomous snakes only. There is one, one second gap between the snake uh, attention and our attention. If you I think his internet is disturbing now. Maybe we can we may wrap up because uh, his network connection is disturbing. Getting getting his friends. friends yes. <laughs> we shall wait <laughs> because I'm curious now. <laughs> yeah, there's one more. Ooh. It's an Indian rat snake. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh my god. It's an Indian rat snake friend of pharma. Uh -huh. It can kill around 2,000 uh, rats in a year. Wow. So must be, uh, uh, very, yeah, so they are uh, friends of farmers. Must yeah. be very beneficial for farmers. Yes. Is it true they cannot digest the fur, fur of any animal, like fur of rat or? No, no, no. It, it, no, it cannot. It can digest. Yeah, it can ex excrete the fur. Why? Because okay. every day we are cleaning these snakes. Every day morning, our main work is to clean all the bodies and all the snakes. Uh, day after day, or uh, day by uh, day by day, they will excrete. In, the, in that excrete, we are going to find some um, eggshells also sometimes. And especially this rat snake, it will crush the egg and uh, swallow all the liquid. It can it can crush the egg of the birds like hens and other things, and it can swallow. For example, if if cobra, it can swallow entire egg. And it will crush like this, and it will uh, scratch in the body, in the stomach. Then, after some time, it will vomit the shell, shell of the bird, uh, body egg. So, what could be your situation if it is a venomous snake and it attacks unknowingly, or if we encounter such a poisonous? So very simple. Very simple. You know, we are living in a, a tropical country, especially in Telangana. We have only seven venomous snakes. That two, very four are very, only four snakes are common to the human, human settlements. Among these four, only two are the very common, common crate and the cobra. And if, if they bite us, we have enough time to go to hospital. For our own uh, uh, work, we discuss with our policy makers like our district collector and other uh, officials in 2015. For each and every primary health center is having anti venom serum. Each and every, even in a small village, even in a gram panchayat level, they have anti venom serum. So within one hour, we may reach a good hospital. So there is no problem. We can survive up to 10 to 15 hours. We can survive. But if, if one should not have fear about the snakes. If fear is there, within one hour or the one and a half hour, he or she is going to die. That is another problem. And every day we are uh, like uh, we are talking with snakes. Hi, how are you like that? Like that. So we feel very comfortable with snakes. Even my my small kids, my my daughter and my son also, they are enjoying like anything. So I think the phobia is the problem. Yeah, that is the major problem for anything. So 
sometimes when we go for field works, uh, we we been told by our mentors that if we if at all we encounter any uh, large snakes or something, to be uh, we were told to carry extra clothes like a dupatta or a overcoats uh, to you know throw uh, if we encounter a snake or any uh, poisonous reptile to throw it on them. How how much it can help you know? No, no, that is wrong. That, that is that is hundred percent wrong way. That is hundred percent wrong way. We should not throw any cloth or uh, cloth or anything under snakes. And one more thing, while we are walking in the field, uh, the the earth will vibrate with our weight. So automatically, the reptiles, especially the snakes, will go uh, away from our area. And very rare case, if they uh, come too close to our body. Don't put anything, uh, anything, uh, even the rocks also. Just go aside. Or otherwise, the wonderful thing is just uh, be like a statue. Be like a statue. Then they will come and enter into your feet and they will go away. I will, uh, while giving training to my students, we are doing this, even with Cobra. Even with Cobra. Enormous times we are doing this. I, I'm, I'm telling to my students, this is the way uh, to eradicate snake bites. If you quite calm, just like a statue. Sometimes in my awareness programs, I leave the cobra to my feet. It will climb up to my waist and, and uh, go down. It, it, it never bites us. It never bites us. I have some videos also. So one thing, uh, one person should not move from one place to another place and the body should not shiver. Then it is easy. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable. Like a, I don't know. Yes, yes. Trust <laughs> I it was snake, but yeah, this is uh, scary. They are very innocent. Very innocent. If we put our foot on that on them, then they will bite. Otherwise, they will not bite. Yeah. You told that there are some surprises. But it's very interesting, yeah, to see <laughs> surprises and learn other yeah. friends. So over to you, Prashatha. And it's like kind of acquiring some life skills, <laughs> life <laughs> life saving skills. Like when you learn about uh, snakes and their behaviors and then how you should react when you see a snake. I think these kind of courses should be uh, offered in the even uh, schools also. Yes. So, yeah. Over to you, Prashatha. Uh, thank you for the enlightening insights on snakes. It was good to know how majority of these creatures are harmless and the importance of shedding the unnecessary fears which we have. So both our speakers have beautifully tried to show how we underscore their vital role in our ecosystem. And I hope all of us will now have a compassionate perspective towards snakes and also help in contributing to both their conservation and the balance of nature. So thank you for your valuable contribution. Uh, deep gratitude to Dr. Jaiti Chaure, Dr. B. Uh, Sadashivaya, uh, Dr. Amit Manhas and uh, K. Srinija Aparna. Uh, next week in the forthcoming Wednesdays for Water uh, session on 18th October at 5 p.m. Uh, do join us for a discussion on mangroves. And do keep checking our social media accounts and websites www.w4w.in for regular updates. Uh, thank you all. Do take care of yourself. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.